said, the first, the first part of the presentation is GHD from Global Cities. This actually is a, I'm going to recap some of the material that you've read about in the, in the course reading on the paper of, uh, that I did. Oh, it's about three, four years ago now, I started the work. Then we're going to see how that work led into a protocol for greenhouse gas in the cities with other players involved in that process. I'm going to very briefly do a little bit of on the GHG emissions for Beijing, just two or three slides, because the pro once we started working on the protocol, it led to me traveling to some very interesting places in the world to present greenhouse gas emissions for very interesting cities, Beijing being one of them. And then uh, I'm going to lead into some IPCC work, or uh, a presentation to, the, uh, to an IPCC meeting just, just about a year and a half ago. Although I'm cheating a little bit here, because I'm going to roll into that some of the work I've been doing with the OECD over the very last year, I've been in Paris for the last year. And so you can see how the ideas and concepts are evolving and emerging throughout this, uh, throughout this presentation. But before I even get to number one, I wanted to tell you about where this really started. I, I got interested in this notion of urban metabolism. And I actually got interested in it about, oh, about 10, 15 years ago when I was first joining the faculty here. And I started studying sustainable cities, and there's been work on metabolism of the city. And the metabolism of the city is just all the inflow and outflow and change in storage of, of energy and materials and nutrients and water in a city. And this was a diagram of the Brussels metabolism that was done in the early 1970s by uh, some uh, Belgian uh, and French uh, ecologists. And there's a classic study of Hong Kong around this period, and then period of 10 years when no one really studies metabolism, and then we started doing one of Toronto uh, about, I think about 10 to 12 years ago. And we brought a number of studies together on metabolism. And it was really much, in the sense, we were interested in the science of cities, right? the, the sustainability of cities as well as obviously inheritance, but we just, it was scientific inquiry, we wanted to know about sustainability. When you've gone around and you've started collecting all the energy flows into cities, and all the waste flows out of cities, what you've essentially done, or what we essentially did, was we, we started collecting all the necessary data that you need to then go and do a greenhouse gas inventory for a city. So our work on greenhouse gas inventories, it just dropped out of us studying metabolism for cities. It, suddenly we actually found ourselves being, in a sense, me and, and others uh, in my area of research, found ourselves being, in a sense, the experts holding the data which enable people to do really good greenhouse gas inventories for cities. So that's where this, this all came from. So we did a paper, this is a paper that you've, that you've read, uh, called the Greenhouse Gas Emissions from Global Cities. And what's interesting about this paper is, this is a study done, I mean, I, I'll be blunt, I, I did most of the work. Okay? <laughs> just, just to be really clear. There's a lot of authors there, right? I did 89% of the work. The key role of the other authors is, they were people in cities, talking to their local governments, and could get their hands on, on data. Okay? They did, into, they did contribute intellectually too. There were two, there were two cities not, meant, not covered by the authors there, the City of London and New York, where we actually, I dealt directly with the city officials, and they didn't really contribute to the, the academic side of the paper. So there were some <coughs> ideas and methods, and there were experts in waste and transport and, and food and all sorts of aspects of metabolism in this group. But we got it together. There was no funding for this work. It was something that we kind of thought was important, so we just did it. And, uh, these were the 10 cities that, that, we, that we studied. Uh, they were, weren't just central cities with, uh, defined by a city government. Some of them were metropolitan regions. So, for example, the should be a CN Tower amongst there. That represents Greater Toronto. You can see uh, Greater London, not just the old city of London. Hollywood is, was, Hollywood was uh, LA County. And, and, and there's others. Geneva was the county of Geneva. Uh, we tried to go for metropolitan regions so we, we captured that suburban transportation element of, uh, of greenhouse gases, which is pretty large in some cities, you know, LA in, in particular, and, and, and North American cities in general. And, uh, you know, at this point, we were looking at the inventory, the main components of the inventory we were looking at were uh, emissions associated with electricity, the heating and industrial fuels rolled in together, ground transportation fuels, aviation and marine fuels. This was quite new, this was quite challenging. Not other people before us have done greenhouse gas inventory for cities, an organization called ICLE, for example. There are a bunch of organizations in Europe doing greenhouse gas emissions for cities. Uh, none of them really with much academics behind them. Uh, none of them have really gone into aviation and marine and recognize that cities are gateways for countries 
and cities' economies depend on goods and, and people flowing in and out of them, and therefore they are the cause and the driver of these, uh, these vehicles that come in and out of them. We also cut to, uh, uh, touched upon industrial processes and obviously emissions from waste. Uh, our approach was very much fuel-based as opposed to sector-based. It wasn't. We didn't break down the electricity used by residential, commercial, industrial. Although it's an ideal, ideally one would do that. When we tried to do that for our ten cities, we found that they all had different classification systems. So some had small business lined in, mixed in with small industrial. Uh, residential was the, divided in different ways. So we really had to focus on just the, the fuels because we, we couldn't really go into the sectors. Uh, too much. We were also wrestling with this concept of life cycle emissions. You know, you can when you when you quantify the greenhouse gas emissions from say a uh, automobile in your, in your city or automobile use in your city, uh, what you're not if you just look at the tailpipe emissions, what you're <coughs> not capturing is the emissions associated with producing that gasoline or diesel uh, upstream, pumping pumping the fuel out of the ground processing it in the refinery and then getting it to the location where it needs to be used. And so uh, here you can see just for uh, well three for three different fuels how you can get the direct emission is can be 20-30% oh, smaller than the life cycle emission. And also how the, the life cycle emission depends on where you are and what life cycle database you were using. And this is an area where it, it's still kind of current in the research on, on, on greenhouse gas emissions. But we were, we were wrestling with that at the, at the point of this, of this study, and I'll, and I'll touch upon it in, in this presentation. We were collecting electricity data from cities for the first time and comparing them, and, and wondering, well, why are Toronto and Denver so high for electricity use compared to other cities? I mean, you see, you can explain some of it by, by temperature, uh, but then you've got places like uh, Prague in there, so maybe age of city also matters, old European cities maybe not, not have as much commercial activity. Whereas Toronto and Denver would have a lot of commercial activity. There again, New York City and London are amongst those cities. And, and you expect them to use an awful lot of electricity as well for their financial sectors and their commercial activities do. But again, they're older cities. So uh, we're still exploring that. We're still exploring. But we, this is the first time we were getting electricity data. This is in per, uh, uh, megawatt hours per capita. And trying to make sense of it. We sort of understand why, uh, why Cape Town would be low down, because it's going to be this mixed, developed, and developing world city at the same time. Many of the others fell between uh, four and six megawatt hours per capita. Most of the cities seem to be in that range, apart from these two that were noticeably higher. And then also we had, to, in order to calculate the greenhouse gas emissions associated with electricity using cities, you also need to know what the, the greenhouse gas intensity of the uh, of the supply is. You know, if it's somewhere like uh, Cape Town or Denver, where most electricity is being supplied from the combustion of coal, then you're going to get Greenhouse gas intensity is as high as over 800 towards a thousand tons of CO2 equivalent per gigawatt hour. Whereas if you're somewhere like Geneva, where it's mainly running hydropower and has a, and a very small emission associated with purchasing some, purchasing but not necessarily receiving uh, natural gas generated electricity from Luxembourg on, on the European trading system, right? Then it has a very low GHG intensity in terms of CO2 per gigawatt hour. And then you get everything in between. So again, we were just, we were beginning, at this stage we were not only discovering what uh, the level of electric energy, uh, electricity use was, and what the, the types of intensity factors were, we were also discovering that different cities have remarkably different control over their electricity supply. Here in Toronto, electricity supply is very much a provincial city. It's, you know, you get it from, uh, from Ontario. New York has something like 80% of its electricity generated within its boundaries or within its control. Barcelona has some local responsibilities, some regional responsibilities, and national responsibilities. European cities are trading on a, on, a, on a European system. London really is part of the UK's national grid. So the way, the relationship between the city and the sources of electricity were actually quite different for our cities. And this, this was interesting and, and new to us. We collected data on uh, heating and industrial fuel use. And unfortunately, they had to be rolled in together. So this is, this is any. This is direct combustion of fuels in the city. Most of it's for heating homes or cooking, but also for heating uh, commercial buildings, heating industrial buildings, 
and also for industrial processes that involve combustion. Right, where, where you've got some industrial process, you need to heat something up. Like, for example, if, if you're making cement, there are two types of industrial emission. There are industrial process emissions not related to heating, such as chemical reaction involved in, in, in the CO2 being released in making cement. And there are also <coughs> the heating process that, that occurs in making cement, which in, may involve burning of, of coal or some other fuel. The general finding here is that colder places <coughs> with high numbers of heating degree days, such as Toronto, Prague, Denver, Geneva to a lesser extent, use more energy consumption. Uh, and this makes total perfect sense to a building scientists or anyone who's really lived in a cold country such as Canada. So it, wouldn't, it should be too much of a surprise. A heating degree day, the unit said degrees centigrade. So if you have it's, it's, it's a measure relative to typical room temperature. So a typical room temperature of 20 degrees, if you have one day at 10 degrees, then you have 10 heating degree days for that one day. And the total heating degree days is summed up over the whole year. So a very cold winter, you have a lot more heating degree days. Another thing we were wrestling with in this study was, was different methods of calculating fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. And here in particular, we're looking at transportation. Uh, in my work on Toronto, because we were looking at the greater Toronto area, which was in a sense as a commuter shed, there are people commute over the boundary of the greater Toronto area, but the number of people commuting over the boundary is really small relative to the number of people traveling, commuting within the boundary on a, on a typical day. So we actually have really good data on gasoline consumption in the GTA based on fuel sales. You think about it, you go to the gas pump, and you purchase gasoline, you get an exact measurement of how much gasoline you consumed, like to, to several decimal places, with a correction for temperature. Ken Marketing, a company that, that collects that information, uh, sums it all up over all the gas stations in the GTA. You actually get a very accurate measurement of the amount of gasoline consumed in the GTA. But if you're looking at a central city uh, like New York, which is not a, which is smaller than the commuter shed. It's not capturing, it's only capturing half of the, of the New York City metropolitan region. You're missing those computer chips. And so that in those cases, you tend to use model data, such as a transportation demand model or transportation survey, to calculate the BKT, the vehicle kilometers traveled, from which if you know what your average uh, fuel, uh, uh, fuel efficiency is, you can then calculate the amount of fuel com combusted and then from that, a greenhouse gas emission. In some cases, you, you might have really poor data and you might say, well, I want to I estimate the amount of gasoline consumed in a city from provincial or state or, net or regional data. And I'll scale that either based on population or if you want to go a bit better than that, you might scale it based on uh, vehicle ownership. And what was needed in this work was we, for three of our cities, we actually had, we were able to do two different methods and see that, that we were actually able to get relatively close agreement on the methods. The error is about 5%, which isn't bad for transportation, because, you know, it's, it's hard to do vehicle counts and, and make transportation model decisions and get gasoline data and wrestle with issues of commuters and, and the changing population. So we were actually quite happy with that, and some of the numbers were quite close. Even the scaled numbers were relatively close. So that was one thing that we learned as we went to that study. And we were able to plot this curve of uh, GHG emissions from transportation against population density. This is a classic Newman and Kenworthy curve that has been critiqued a fair bit in their data, which was a bit more patchy than ours. They had more cities but more uncertainties. And we were, because we had a smaller data set, we were able to really home in and, and as you saw in the last slide, really test the methodologies and test the data. And I can tell you that spot for Bangkok on there went up and down fair enough. We, we, had, we went to Bangkok several times and said, are you really sure that's your number? Because you're higher than Los Angeles just now. We think that's wrong. Right? And uh, they came back and said, oh yes, sorry, we made a mistake and here, here is our number and we checked it another way. And, and it kind of felt where we expected it to be, you know, which is good. And you'll see as, we, as I continue, there's going to be more cities appearing on this curve as we, as we progress through my, my, my story of, of how this, this work progressed. We started collecting uh, information on jet fuel loaded at major airports. Uh, we haven't really done any regression analysis of this. I mean, it's sort of, you know, Heathrow Airport's the biggest airport in the world, or one of the busiest, that competing with New York and maybe Chicago. 
And uh, we're, we, get, we did this just to quantify the emission associated with the jet fuel. We don't really know, you know the drivers behind why certain cities have more passenger, uh, air passenger transportation. But we, and so this was new data. You know, it makes Toronto Pierce and airport look quite, quite small when you compare it to, to the, the London and New York and even Los Angeles and Bangkok there. Uh, so, uh, and it isn't just a matter of the number of passengers going to the airport, it's also a matter of, you know, is your airport, is it a continental hub or is it a global hub? Is it a, is it a place that people are flying really long distances into from all over the world in the case of somewhere like London or New York? And Toronto's going that way to some degree. We also started collecting data on waste. Here I'm actually showing the emissions. And the reason why Cape Town and Bangkok are, 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 are way ahead of the others here is, is to do with how much, how much methane capture is going on in the cities. And there's a bit of, there were some estimates there. Uh, I mean, I think we assumed there was no methane capture in Bangkok and Cape Town. And our, we had people from Camp Bangkok and Cape Town on the team, and they seemed to think that was appropriate. Whereas the, the, the developed world cities there, we were, Largely, we saw that there was around about 75% methane capture, and that substantially reduces emissions from associated with waste from cities. So, this slide is a little bit busy to take in. You'll actually, one of the things you'll notice, I hope, <laughs> is that over the progress of this lecture, and as you see the progress of this research, you see a, a progress in the presentation style, an improvement in the communication uh, uh, of the results. Here we're, we're contrasting direct emissions that actually occur within the city, uh, sorry, within the city emissions in yellow. Direct emissions are emissions within the city plus emissions associated with electricity used in the city where the combustion of the production of the electricity actually occurs outside of the city. Uh, which is obviously, in some cases, in some cities it, it makes a difference, in some cities it doesn't. And then in the red bar, you begin to see uh, some of the life cycle emissions with some of the fuels used in the cities, not the whole life cycle emissions. So you can see the, some of that upstream emissions that I talked about earlier. So you can see, I mean, first of all, you can see that Denver is way ahead of all the other cities. Most of the other, there are quite a, a lot of cities in the sort of the 10 to 15 tons of CO2 per capita emissions. And then your star performance are cities like Barcelona that are down at 4 tons per, per CO2 per capita uh, for, for the direct emission, the direct emission at least right there. So again, this was all learned. This was new for us. We were learning. You know, by doing emissions for 10 different cities, by the same methodologies, we were learning why the city the cities differed and how they differ. Oh, sorry, let me just go back to that. Just one last thing, just to, to really give you a little bit more of insight into that effect of upstream emissions. Well, this is a slide that we put together, again, this is about, I put together for about three or four years ago, where we just took, com contrasted the, tro the city of Toronto's 2004 infantry where the city of Toronto has, is said to have a THC emission of about 9.3 tons per capita. And when we move from Toronto to the GTA, so we, we bring in you know, York and, and Peel and Durham and, and, uh, and the rest, uh, you can see that we go up to 12.1 tons per capita. No change in natural gas, very little change in electricity. The major increase is in gasoline goes up from 2.4 tons per capita to 2.9 tons per capita. But we begin to pick up the airport, with the jet fuel, we begin to pick up uh, cement manufacturing in, in, in uh, Mississauga, so the more industrial emissions. And also, I believe, oh, yeah, the other difference here is we can the City of Toronto's report didn't include commercial waste, which is about double residential waste in terms of tonnage, not in terms of CO2 emissions. But that's why the... Uh, Actually, it is almost in terms of CO2, but that's why the, the, the waste went up there. And then, when you're the very next part, the GTA life cycle, and you begin, in this case, we're only looking at life cycle emissions of natural gas and, and gasoline and diesel, you can see that those numbers, those three numbers get even, even larger because we're, we're, we're including the, the upstream. So, you know, what was 9.3 is now quickly beginning to grow to 14.1. And if you had more upstream emissions, it would get even bigger soon. So there's an understanding of of what really goes into an inventory and how you can get different numbers depending on what you're, you're counting. It's coming out of this out of this work. And this is all really important for the next the next stage I'm going to talk about now. So what happened was so we did this study of the ten cities. 
uh, like I said, it was, there was no financial support. We did it through the form. She presented at a couple of conferences. And then there was an opening of the city centre here at U of T about four years ago. And I got talking to this guy uh, from the World Bank, and I said, you know, hey, you think like some data on greenhouse gas in cities. He'd been struggling for five years to try and get data on greenhouse gas emissions for cities. And I said, oh, here's a paper, we've got 10 cities in that. He said to me, oh, this is great, Chris. Can you do 40 cities for me <laughs> for, the, for this summer? We're going to have a, a conference in Barcelona. Can you do that? That was really hard to do. I couldn't do 30 more cities collecting raw data from at source. So you took it a year and a half to run that first 30, 10 cities. But I was beginning to learn of other people around the world that were beginning to form similar data sets. So we, we all got together. We had to iron out our differences in methodology, which was, which was a useful exercise. But Anu from uh, Ramos Valley University of Colorado Denver had a data set of 10 US cities on top of the ones I had. South County from Manchester had about 14 or 15 European cities or city regions. And Shoba Kaladu Kaladu from uh, uh, Japan, Tokyo and Japan, he, he had his fingers on of what, what Asian data we could get at that time. And so we, we brought that together. Uh, and the, the subtle push was here. Uh, there's, there's something a little bit more going on here. There's a political play going on. The World Bank had been wrestling with other organizations that did have data on GHP. But one, we're not publishing it, and two, had really poor quality control because there was nothing opened up inside. There was, the issue I just raised was the Toronto being 9.3 versus 14. That was not being addressed because no one could see the mess of the calculation and see how the numbers were being arrived at. There was no academic oversight into the data. So we were also being part of a political process to try and get the planet all moving in the same direction in doing greenhouse gas emissions for cities, and you'll see that play out a bit more. Our, our measures of greenhouse gas emissions for cities were seen by the bank as being one of several measures that the, the new urban governance of the uh, is to be concerned. It seems like urban competitiveness is a, a measure that grows metropolitan product and material flows for cities. There's a whole bunch of in this, in this 21st century emergence of cities that being politically more relevant, or politically more relevant than they were in the last century. Is, there's a whole bunch of statistics and data that's required for cities. Ours has been one of them. We recognize a number of people doing these, this sort of So ICLA in particular is an organization that had been close early in the game of GHG for cities. Grip with Sebastian Kahn out of Manchester. There were academic studies, there were, there were workshops out in Asia where two cities have been studied and partial data. There was an interesting point I made about Paris, Tokyo, and London. Paris was doing greenhouse gas inventories using a method developed by the French Ministry for Ecology and Environment. It changes its name fairly often, actually. They had really good detailed life cycle inventory. They were doing the best life cycle inventories for cities I'd ever seen. But they'd done it like once, maybe twice. Tokyo was doing annual reporting of greenhouse gas inventories. And now a few cities do that now, but Tokyo had been doing it for years. And so they were doing really good time series data for, for, for GHCs. London was spatially disaggregating its greenhouse gas emissions between all its boroughs. So they were spatially disaggregating. Right? So you got you know, three different big cities strong on three different attributes of, of, of greenhouse gas emissions, but none doing the whole package. Right? So there's always, again, this is the, 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 the state of the play. So what we were really needed, we, we needed to establish an open global protocol for attributing GHG emissions to urban areas. That was, that, was, that was really what we needed, and this is what we were there to talk about. And we also needed to then back that up with, with some comparable baseline measures for cities. That was, so that was a, this is what we were charged to do by the bank. Here was just one example. New York City, uh, its inventory done for 2007. New York City and London, and some of the biggest cities have been real drivers in, in this work, and dedicated people and offices towards doing the business. But, you know, underlined in red there is, there can, is this point that there's an understanding of the different methodologies we used in comparing uh, New York City to these, uh, these other cities here. And notice how Toronto is now 9.6 in this one. Right? <laughs> yeah, question? Sorry, so just to clarify, when you're, you spoke about material flows into the cities, and does that, the greenhouse gas emissions, does it include the emissions from manufacturing those materials, say a fridge, 
computers, all, all that stuff that goes into this. They come into this? Yeah, that would be enough to see. calculations, are they included in this? In this one, figures? no. This wouldn't be in this page, no. Some, some inventories have done that, but very few. The upstream emissions that I showed you were for like the fuels important to see. But the upstream, the, but the upstream emissions associated with stuff, industrial goods, consumer goods. The only place that's really done it well is Denver and, and uh, recently in Singapore, because it's a city state. It's hard to do, it's very hard to get the data. So you won't see much of that. It's, it's, a, it's an area we're going to. But anyway, so the point is that New York City is saying, hey, you know, here we're comparing against these other cities, but we don't know whether it's comparable. So those are two part presentations. And so, the, the, the challenge that we were faced is that <laughs> the guy in the bank said to me, you know, Chris, we need something that's consistent with IPCC guidelines for nations. It's also consistent with WRI, well, that's the World Resources Institute protocol for corporations doing scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And it's consistent with the way you play and others have been doing it. And you try to be consistent with all three, that's kind of challenging. Yeah. That may not be a possible problem to solve. So you, you just try and hit the middle ground somewhere in between. But the IPCC guidelines are strictly territorial based, they're strictly production based emissions. They don't consider material flowings into your city or your territory because it's just direct emission from your territory. And the IPCC national scale, IPCC, IPCC at the national scale, they break down their emissions into four major categories of which the energy is the most major and important one for cities. Uh, agricultural, forestry, and other land use, very small, almost negligible, not considered by many cities. It wasn't considered in our 10 cities paper. But then Sebastian Carney, who had been looking at some greater metropolitan regions of Europe, said, I just got a couple of cities, Hamburg and Paris, where including their agricultural lands around the city, with very intensive agriculture, we're actually getting non-insignificant, that's a double, <laughs> double negative, right? We're actually getting significant <laughs> emissions, right? And so we need to think about whether we need to include that or not in this protocol, right? And so, it's, you know, we were, again, we were learning more stuff as we went along. On the industrial processes too, you know, if you have a cement plant like Mississauga, suddenly industrial process emissions matter. New York, we never counted our industrial process emissions. We don't have any industry left in the city, right? So it's, it, you know, and if you're going to go into developing old cities, which is where we're going to go to next, then the industrial process emissions are actually going to turn out to be quite important. So, you can see again, there was sort of a, a winding of the scope, a thinking about other sectors. So we have certainly had to deal with emissions in these four broad sectors and also put, maintain the sectors that we've been working with, but put it in the context of the IPCC language. And then we had this WRI protocol for corporations that so the people like Anne and others were beginning to develop the city. So, corporations have a scope one emission, which is emissions controlled by the, within the corporate boundary, operated within the corporate boundary. And then scope two is electricity emissions. So the, the corporation purchases electricity and there's an emission associated with that, with that electricity. And we've been doing the same thing for cities. We've been counting scope two. But then the scope three emission is the consequence of all activities of the company. And so that, that's your more upstream emissions. So we've been kind of doing this in parallel for cities. As for corporations, but then what was pushed upon us was, or well, you should adapt, you should develop, adopt the same terminology for scopes to cities as you use for as you use for corporations. And in actual fact, a city is not the same as a corporation; it's basically defined very differently. And there, there are there were real wrestling problems in actually to the details in, in dealing with this, especially when, when cities do things like export their waste. City exports waste, is that the scope 2 emission, or scope 3 emission, or scope 1 emission? And we went round and round in circles on some of these things. I'm not going to tell you the answers to all of them, but it is. Anyway, so we, uh, the part of this presentation to the World Bank, we, we brought together all this data, data from 40 cities. We did a big massive matrix showing where there was consistency and inconsistency between the different cities. You, you don't need to look at the detail here, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of the process we went through. Uh, 
Prabhupada talked about electricity coming in from cities. That was one of the issues. We talked about the different types of methods of, of uh, quantifying gasoline emissions. This is repeat. I mean, you can see the slide's getting better. Nicer pictures, more succinct delivery. Yeah, so this was to an audience of 500 people, uh, not not to uh, an academic audience in, in, a, in a small conference, right? So it was it was getting the issue of aviation began. Th th this was a really big. This was becoming, in a sense, we got more. We got into something bigger than we realized. We began to realize that many cities were excluding aviation emissions. They just weren't considering their airports. You know, the emissions, the aviation emissions. There's a bit of emission on the runway as airplanes are taking off and landing. But most of the emissions from aircraft are actually up in the sky away from the cities. So it's a scope three emission. It's outside the boundaries and it's not electricity use. And it's not all cities cope with cash flow, do you? Then you say, well, what, about, what does the UNFCC do for aviation emissions? Well, oh, it is a bit of a problem. The UNFCC only includes domestic emissions from aircraft. Right? They, there is uh, voluntary reporting of emissions from international trips by aircraft. So if you've got a trip, if you're a big country like Canada, and you've got lots of trips between Vancouver and Toronto, that's domestic aviation. All those emissions get counted in Canada's greenhouse gas inventory. If you're a small country like Belgium, you don't have any <laughs> domestic aviation, right? But you're part of Europe, and Europe would have, would have emissions, right? So, now, depending on which, which country the city's in, do you, would you follow the UNFCCC guidelines? So there's problems there with the national and the international system. So we were, from our previous work with 10 cities, we were saying you should just include all emissions from aviation, you know, domestic and international, to reflect the urban economy. So that was, that was a talking point, and still is to some degree today. Some of them have raised, well, the issue was raised, issue, what about trains? What about you know high speed trains? How do you <coughs> they're more difficult than than, the, than aeroplanes because aeroplanes go from one city to another city. There's nothing really in between. It, I mean sometimes they land because there's more passengers, but that's really quite rare. Whereas trains pass through places and people get on and off. So then you've got an extra distributional uh, issue to wrestle with. Thankfully, there's not great emissions from, from trains. I mean some of the old big dirty diesel trains running across North America may have some emissions, but they're not. There's not a lot of them, right? So it's not, it's not a, a big issue. But I've already talked a bit about marine. Landfill waste as well, we were going to discover that uh, there were at least five different measures and te techniques being used to do landfill waste. I'm not going to go over them here because I, I want to skip on to something more interesting. Uh, we were also, you know, we were giving this presentation in Marseille, so we wanted to recognize that uh, Bilan Carbon, this French ministry, uh, this tool developed by this French ministry, was beginning to uh, include greenhouse gas emissions embodied in building materials, the maintenance of vehicles, the refining of fuels, which we've done, the transport of merchandise to the city, which was answering your question, that they, they were actually doing, they were doing some of that, and food, which is a huge, you know, potentially three tons of capita uh, emissions embodied in food. That's what uh, some of Adam's work out of Denver would show. So th these are substantial sources. So we showed some results for in-boundary energy use emissions, uh, including non-energy industrial emissions, waste, and agriculture where we had it, but not going beyond that in the life cycle. And this was, and we, first of all, we presented the results in terms of the total emissions, millions of tons of CO2. So we got even, we got even really beginning to get numerous. So Los Angeles was approaching 100 million tons of CO2 equivalent. Toronto, New York, around about 60, Mexico City, down about no, 30, and, and Sao Paulo and, and, and Rio is quite similar, getting down to the lower end. So in terms of total tonnage, uh, Los Angeles is, is a bigger city. You know, so it, it, it's, got, it's got a high emission, a high emission there. So you expect it to have a, a high total emission. When you go to per capita terms, it turns out Toronto is actually higher than Los Angeles and, and New York City. Uh, it's not as high as Denver, as we know. Denver is, is on our list, this graph, but it's a selection of the larger cities. And then, you know, it's to do with the climate, uh, mainly, and, and the industry in Toronto. Here was what was our, our really big take, uh, takeaway, though. For the first time, we were now getting data on Chinese cities combined with uh, 
North American cities. Shanghai is a very big city, 20 million people. About, you know, so it's double the size of New York City. So now we're talking 200 million tons. We did a calculation at the time that if Shanghai was a country, it would have the 25th highest emissions of all the countries. It was higher than, it was higher than Argentina. It was higher than the Netherlands. It was higher than Romania. It was higher than Egypt. You know? <laughs> it was really big. The, the data we have for Shanghai, this is where Lorraine had come on, on board. Lorraine she did. Shobakar had done some, some previous work. Uh, and we needed to take his previous work and we needed to add to it to make it consistent with other work. So Lorraine started looking at the Shanghai data. Uh, and, and Beijing and other Chinese cities and region, just to make sure that we were consistent in methodology to back up this, you know, this play here with really high emissions. And, and even in per capita terms, the, the, the Asian cities, Bangkok, uh, Shanghai, and Beijing were, were very similar to, you know, to some of the, not they weren't as high as Denver, but they were similar to some of the higher, uh, the other cities that we had in our established in our, in our growing database. We ended the, uh, this presentation at uh, the World Bank Symposium with this idea that, uh, that a protocol with city-based deactivations was, was possible. We were not quite there, but we were beginning to bring many cities onto the same map, the same playing field, and we could begin to compare them and know why there were differences and know where there were differences in emissions. And then within about nine months, uh, UNET the World Bank and New Habitat basically adopted our methodology and said, hey, we've got a global protocol for doing GHGs from cities. But you've also got to realize that this was a bit of a political play as well because they didn't actually have ICLE and others on board for this, right? And they do now, the C40 and ICLE and these three and a few others, including those who have 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 approved or have agreed that something along the lines, it's not necessarily our standard, it's equally <coughs> ours, in fact, equally in C40, and then we're taking the lead on the next version. But they're, they're all getting on the same plane, they're all getting on the same thing. So there was, some, there was some convergence in policy that came out of it. But okay, I'm going to go through another uh, 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Oh, you've it up. Yeah, just like, yeah, it's a good time to just. Yeah, yeah. So, just a question about your slide on uh, electricity per capita around cities, which is yeah. very interesting because Denver and Toronto that's very high. Which uh, I was wondering, have you plotted the data against uh, population density? Because um, you know, you know, European cities and uh, London and New York have a very high population density, right. while Denver and Toronto has a large suburban area. So, do you think that... I, I think it could have a role. I'm going to come back to it, because I'm going to show you some more data on that. But there's, we'll hold that one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering when you embarked on all, all these studies, if uh, you had a notional uh, purpose or intent, was it like work to ultimately measure or help, help uh, create controlling mechanisms? Like, I see all the, 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 the immense difficulties in these things, like for their aviation. Is it the city of origin? Is it the city of destination? Right. Is it the city of the passengers on board? Or the commerce? Like, how, how do you attribute all these things? And so, uh, you, I mean, you can't control GHG emissions on the planet unless you can measure them right. and, and apply uh, and they be used as a policy tool. So I'm trying to reconcile in my mind, okay, where does this fit into with uh, carbon trading and emissions trading and, and uh, you know, what's well, these it? various schemes in the, around the world for, for, for measuring and controlling you. Well, you set me up perfectly, Andy, and, and you're reminding me something. Okay. Where did it fit in with carbon trading? Uh, the reason why the World Bank wanted consistent methodology was because they wanted to get carbon trading going between the cities. Ah. All right? At the city level. And they can't do that unless, unless they knew that people were doing common measures. And at some point, the measures with the aviation it does leave the science and just become a policy issue and, and trying to get people to agree. You know, there's nothing more than that. The World Bank actually uh, we published our GHGs from Global Cities paper and one month later the World Bank gave us several hundred million dollars to Bangkok or to Thailand technically if it's to the country of which 76 million dollars was specifically because they had a GHG in Bangkok that we'd done for them without them paying for it. 
<laughs> I could have done with a cut of that, but I didn't get any. <laughs> okay? But it was, again, it was because they could then start doing, rolling out this financial mechanism for the, for the carbon trading issue. That's where, and they're still rolling it out. It's <laughs> rolling very slowly, I can tell you. But that's where it's going. Yeah, one of the back and then I'll keep going. Okay, coming back to the uh, aviation question. How would they factor in then that uh, certain airports are designated hubs, even if they are uh, are in slightly smaller cities? For example, looking at Germany, uh, Berlin, and M Berlin, Munich, Hamburg are all way bigger cities than Frankfurt. But Frankfurt's going to have all the emissions because that's a very big airport. So how would that be factored in? My answer to that one is because I'm, I'm keen on cities getting emissions for their airport is by having that airport in Frankfurt it actually has some, some economic benefits to that city. Right, of course. It, it, not only local employment at the airport, but, but wider economic benefits to that, to that city's economy. And therefore, it seems reasonable for it to pick up that, pick up those emissions in, to have a tribute to it. It's also way, way easier to, to, if you want to do emissions from aeroplanes, if you come down to the, the, the practical question of how do you go about calculating them, the numbers, the data you can get is you can get the, the amount of fuel loaded onto planes at your airport. Right? That's the number to go with. That can be converted into a GHG quite easily. You don't worry too much about passengers switching planes or passengers going other places or people from outside the city using the airport. <coughs> Others wrestle with that, but I, I, I just, my, from the policy <laughs> insight that I've seen, the simpler the better on that one, I think. But if they, for example, if you fly Toronto to Ottawa and back on a full tank, and they always just decide to do all the fueling in Toronto, that would obviously create a huge bias towards Toronto. If, that, if that's the case, do, but do they do that on a fuel full tank? Sorry, they don't run out a full tank on a flight. No, no, I know, but would they, would they not refuel in Ottawa, or they would actually load it up? I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, See, I'm my, my assumption is that they always refuel at the airport. I may be wrong. You could have me. I'm sure on Ottawa, it may be short enough. Yeah, that's but why I chose But that. then it's a short flight, and therefore it's not got a lot of fuel. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good, they're really good, they're really good questions. Don't, I mean, don't get me wrong, they're, they're really good questions, and, and we've wrestled with There them. is political stuff in there as well, just for example, in the Middle East, uh, the Arab nations will have cheap fuel to encourage you know, their airports as hubs, right? So that, that skews the way things, you know, yeah. it's another variant of a... Absolutely, yeah. yeah no, and, and, and trying to make your airport, like the Dubai hub idea, is really important economically. Let me, let me just roll into these two, because what, re, what really emerged after this was that now I became, in some respects, the World Bank's go-to guy. And uh, I would go into to some crazy places in the world, flying in there and, and reporting on what the greenhouse gas emissions were for a certain city. So we actually went, I went to Beijing, you know, Lorraine obviously done some work on this, and she had a, an internship, sort of with the World Bank virus company in Toronto. Uh, you know, I went into a municipal building in Beijing and what had ping pong tables really you know, up to the, the, the eighth floor and gave my presentation with a with a, with, a, with a translator and 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 you know it was really fascinating. It was just a fascinating thing to do was to go into the city. And what really surprised me because I I had uh, one week later after being in Beijing, I was at Harvard doing a presentation and meeting I was sitting at a table at lunch with a whole bunch of Municipal leaders from maybe eight or ten U.S. cities. There was Denver there, there was New York, there was a few others, San Francisco. And the ambition of those ten U.S. cities around that table was about this. And Beijing at lunch, they were saying, Chris, we want to build a carbon neutral central business district in Beijing. Right? A new central business district, right? Their ambition was up here. And their understanding of the, of the greenhouse gas issue was huge. There was, no, there was no, you know, I wasn't having to sort of twist their arms <laughs> into convincing them that they had these, you know, you know gas emission gas emissions, something bad. No, they're totally on the, totally on the ball. Really, really forward looking in their approach. Uh, they were a little bit surprised though when I gave them this slide, <laughs> having said that. I, this was, this was, uh, I, this was, I was encouraged, uh, actually by the company in Toronto, said this is a good way to start talking to the Chinese. Compare Beijing to London and New York City, because I'll start by thinking that's, that's what, who they want to be compared to. 
right? They want to be in that club of big global cities, right? And, and they are, to be honest. Uh, they are in several ways, both politically, economically, but also in terms of their emissions. <laughs> you know, right, right, right in there with London and New York. For different reasons, though. Uh, yeah, I think I got the slide. London's got uh, big aviation emissions. Uh, Beijing's got fairly small aviation emissions. Uh, Beijing's emissions are really high electricity because they're still burning a lot of coal to generate that electricity. Actually, there was one slide, and I'm going to show you this slide later. You see that like, Beijing's electricity consumption in 2006 was actually fairly low. It was on the low end. And believe it or not, that was the thing that insulted them most. There's a whole hour and a half presentation. I had a slide showing the electricity use in Beijing was kind of low. And they said, it was like close to Cape Town. And they, they were insulted because they don't want to be seen as the developing world city. Right? They want to have more electricity used because they're a first you know, world city, right? That was, and that was, really, that, was my, that was the only sort of point where I thought, oh, I upset them a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing else. Everything else was really cool, but it was just, uh, you know, that was a little insight. Uh, anyway, that, that's all I'm going to say about Beijing, because, I mean, you know, we did Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, and Lorraine then started looking at Amman. I, I did a trip to Amman. Uh, for, uh, actually, it was for UN Habitat Conference, and while I was there, the guy from World Bank said, well, can't you just go to Oman and to the city manager in Oman and do a presentation of their emissions? I went down to South Africa. Uh, we also did, I didn't go to Jakarta and Dar es Salaam, but we did the emissions for those two cities as well, in, in, in Lorraine's work. So we, we were really get, getting into the developing world, which is where the World Bank's you know, clients are, and uh, learning about emissions in very different types of cities. Uh, and, you'll, and you'll see some of this data coming through. And then, uh, but for the last sort of, you know, uh, 15 minutes, I just want to give some more up-to-date work. Uh, there was a meeting in Kolkata 2011, IPCC, so these are the, the, the expert scientific community on, on greenhouse gas emissions. And what was interesting here is the IPCC have largely ignored cities in their work up to this point. And they had this expert meeting where they brought together I think about 40 of us, uh, it was an expert on human settlements, so it wasn't specifically labeled cities, but it was really about cities. And it had both the, the way the IPCC is divided, there's those people who've got mitigation, and those who work on adaptation. And this meeting was about both of those groups together. So it was, you know, it was very interesting in that, in that sense. And I, and I, I gave a presentation there, I talked about the driving <coughs> of the CHG emissions, which you've kind of seen from, from what I've given so far. Some of them work through, with about, tracking greenhouse gas emissions from different cities, how emissions are actually changing, how some cities are actually making improvements, reducing their emissions. So some of the planning tools, and some of the strategies that may be employed, uh, which some of the insights I can show you from this work. ...sense of this, how you know, we've added there, certainly the, the Chinese cities have been added. I haven't actually got the, 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 the Jakarta and Dar es Salaam on there. But the other thing is, uh, this actually, this, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit. This slide is later than the IPCC meeting. Uh, I just substituted it about 10 minutes ago. No, not 10 minutes ago, I was here. 10 minutes before the lecture. Because the Chicago and Paris de France, this, this is now OECD, where I've been for the last year. And OECD have now developed, adapted to some degree my methodology. Or they say they're using the same charts in their publications. They do these these city studies mainly about it's about green growth, about economic development in, in, in urban regions. And so you can see Chicago and Paris were two of the cities that I, that I was working on while I was I was in in, in, in Paris. Uh, Chicago fell pretty much where we expected in terms of transportation emissions. Paris still to France was a very was a bit of a surprise in terms of its, uh, its transportation emissions. Uh, it's, uh, I know we're in Kolkata just now, and I'm now digressing into Paris, and then I'm going to come back to Kolkata. Okay? Uh, but Paris was a surprise because the city of Paris is very, very dense. It's off the chart. It's higher than Barcelona, Barcelona and Shanghai. Right but it's, it's actually only 2 million people out of a region of about 11 million. And the, the region of Paris, France, is actually quite low density. It's actually a bit like a North American city in some respects. 
But its emissions are not very high because it's got really amazing transportation. It's got a super regional rail system, a super metro system, a super <coughs> national rail system. And so Paris is, is, falls a little bit away from this chart. Uh, it's still close enough that we, you know, we're comfortable with it, but it, you know, the, po the population density is a bit lower than well, I would have guessed when I... But it's, it's data from, from the region, they should know what the, the density is. This is the electricity curve. I didn't show this one before. You remember the very first slide uh, slides we had of the 10 cities, we were plotting bar charts of consumption and bar charts of electricity emissions factor. And then one of the innovations we had as we went along was uh, Lorraine and I were sitting down one day, we were sort of brainstorming and said, well, why don't we put this emissions factor on an, an extra y-axis uh, with diagonal lines, and then we can put the emissions, the total emissions on one y-axis, we can put the emissions factor on the other y-axis, and the consumption on the bottom. And so we can work out that basically we multiply the consumption on the bottom by the emissions factor on the diagonal axis, and that gives you the total on the other way axis. So you can begin to group the cities in terms of, of intensity of emissions. So to the, to the question of, you know, uh, do Denver and Toronto have high electricity consumption because of their density? Uh, it's possibly an explanation but it's not the whole picture. Now, we've added one city there, Chicago, but hey, that's a very similar type of city to Toronto and Denver, right? They have a very much a similar type of Los Angeles. Los Angeles has got, you know, they've got more you know, a similar density to, uh, to Toronto or Chicago. <coughs> it, doesn't have a lot of, it doesn't have a lot of electricity use for heating and cooling, uh, Los Angeles. Even, even air conditioning isn't that prevalent in Los Angeles, surprisingly. I mean, it's, it's almost in a desert, but it's by the coast, so it gets cool, it gets some natural cooling. So it's probably a combination of the density, amount of commercial activity, uh, latitude. You know, how, how close is it to the North Pole? will determine how much lighting is required. We're still trying to build more data on cities, electricity use, uh, in order to really get a better handle on the factors behind it, underlying it. So, uh, again, continuing with this, this expert in, 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 in Calcutta, this shows some, you know, some other work we've been doing, which was, this isn't our calculations of greenhouse gas emissions, but these are cities' own calculations themselves. And we've actually done a paper where we focused on a handful, seven shown here, we, we dropped Vancouver eventually from this paper, because we only had two days before, because one was really old. But there were actually six cities, seven cities that had actually improved their emission inventory over time in per capita terms. So now Boston had gone down and up, it actually went down again after that. Berlin had gone down and New York City had gone down and London and Greater Toronto area had gone down. And it was mainly from stationary combustion. There were some minor improvements in transportation emissions, partly because of the financial crisis hits in 2008. And so economies start going down and therefore transportation activity goes down. But that wasn't the explanation for the decreases here. There were, there were some active measures by cities. Interestingly, in the case of Boston, what they did was they switched from oil-based electricity to natural gas-based electricity when the price changed. And the following year, the price changed back to change, so they, they both became different. So it was really an economic factor coming into play in there, more than a we must reduce our emissions factor. And even someone like New York and London are very, you know, very forward on reducing their emissions. They're, they're always looking for the co-benefits. They're always looking for the health co-benefits. They're always looking for the, the energy system benefits. The, the saving home heating bill benefits. The, the, the going. So to me, I look at this and I, I, it seems encouraging that uh, you've got a sampling, six, seven cities, all of them, you've got a declining GHG emissions per capita. That's yes. good news. Part of me says, uh, what would you attribute that to? Well, maybe there's declining economic activity. That might be one reason. And then the other part of me says, is it really good news because uh, uh, global population is continuing to still grow at, at a robust rate so yeah. that uh, net GHG emissions still continue to, to, to rise? You're absolutely right. right. Yeah, no, this is... This, and it's a, it's a very valid criticism that, you know, you've got to look at the total emission, not just the capital emission if populations are going up. Right? Uh, and also this is a drop in the profit stuff. You know, if, if 
if uh, like one city shaves two percent, five percent of its emissions, and China and Beijing are still growing like this, yeah. well, you know, it, this is this is small. What, what would you? I mean, what would your gut sense tell you if you sampled a hundred cities around the world? I mean, you don't have that size, that well, sample size, but I guess that's what people want to know. Right? Yeah. Well, well. I, I mean, I can answer it in a certain way because what we specifically set out to do here was collect to buy a sample. We went out to collect a sample of cities that were reducing emissions. Oh, okay. We only came up with six, <laughs> right? And I've already talked about 40, 50 cities, right? What we found is, I mean, the one takeaway was cities that actually do repeat inventories are more likely to be reducing emissions than those that aren't doing repeat inventories, right? Because they're actually on the ball and they're, they're trying to they're actually on top of the issue. They can't, they, they, they care about it. Uh, and I said it was mainly stage three combustion, but the cancer for weather going down. But, uh, and we're still, this is still, well, this is quite a, this is last year, so it's still relatively new. It's only published this year, so it's, it's still, we're actually in the process with one of my current PhD students of going back to these cities and saying, can you tell us more about how you can reduce your emissions? Do you have any cost data on, on, uh, on, on the measures you took? Can you tell us more how much it was in economic effects versus policy effects, those kind of things. So we, we were, we were, uh, we're still, this is very much in progress. This, this kind of, this stuff. Uh, just uh, in this particular presentation I gave in Calcutta, I also pointed to some tools that are done. There are a lot of organizations beginning to develop tools for reducing emissions. So this is one out of the Rupertal Institute uh, in, uh, in Germany, once with Siemens, who were doing scenarios for reducing Munich greenhouse gas emissions. And looking, looking at major cuts, so looking at 2050 and saying, how do we reduce by 80%, how do we reduce by 90%. We also have a tool uh, called the Carbon Neutral City Planner, which we developed here with my research group, uh, which, apply, which is, gives you a method of predicting reduce, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions for all, a bunch of fairly adventurous strategies and, it, and it, you can do it for any municipality in Canada. It's got some data already programmed into it. You can choose technologies that you can apply, and you can see what kind of efforts are made are required to go to really, really low emissions. Uh, and you can mix and match. But well, I, on, the, on the question of strategies, this was one of the last, uh, the last things. This is one of the most up to date where I'm at in terms of the work on greenhouse gas emissions and cities. Uh, and recall we had graphs of electricity consumption in the cities and with that funny diagonal y-axis which had the carbon intensity of supply on, on, on one axis. So I've taken that and I've put that onto the, uh, the y-axis of this graph. We also had graphs showing uh, transportation emissions from cities where density or urbanized density was, was the x-axis and was shown to be a major effect. So that's now the x-axis on this graph and now I'm plotting Actually, I'm back to my 10 original cities plus my three Chinese cities. And the, the point here is to show that different cities with different combinations of density and carbon intensity of electricity should be taking different strategies to reduce their emissions. Let me try to explain these lines somewhat. The, the, the vertical line is basically your, 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 your changing gradient in your transportation curve where you go from high to low density cities, the problem. <coughs> and when you're in, in the low density cities, such as a Los Angeles or a Denver, and, and GTA, if you like to be, you know, <coughs> build all the public transportation you like. You, you can spend a billion dollars on a Metrolink, big move, and a Metrolink predicts that it will not reduce GHG emissions, or it will go up or down by 1% 1 relative to 2050. Because you've already got an auto dominated urban form, an auto dominated city. Yeah, do, do public transit for other reasons, like alleviating congestion, to the extent you can. But it is it's not the solution to really existing sprawled out cities. You can't rebuild your city in 20, 30 years uh, around public transit. You just can't, they just physically is too, too demanding. So those cities have to look to other strategies, uh, and in particular, different types of automobiles. So we've got electric vehicles down there as one of the strategies. But you've got to be careful with electric vehicles, because those electric vehicles are being supplied by a high carbon intensity electricity grid, then your greenhouse gas emissions are going to go up. They're going to be higher than they were if the cars are burning gasoline. Uh, and we put the number roughly at about 500 
uh, if you go, uh, tons of CO2 that they go out. That also is that, that number actually was determined based on ground source heat pumps. We've done some other work looking at applications of ground source heat pumps. If you so ground source heat pump for the you know building technology, you're, you're using electricity to run a pump, pump heat from the ground to, to, to warm your building. You're, you're using less heat, but you're substituting once about one third of it to an energy coefficient. One third of the energy in terms of electricity. If you run a ground source heat pump to, to a building in Alberta to replace the use of natural gas, you increase your ground gas greenhouse gas emissions because natural gas does not have as bad a greenhouse gas emission as coal does, and you're burning coal to generate your electricity. So there's a point where ground source heat pumps are better, you know, some cities can use them, some cities can't. And then, and then this whole graph then begins to grow. You can see schemes like district energy systems only makes sense if your buildings are close together and it's economically more viable to do district energy. So therefore, they're better for the, the, the high density cities. Now there is some variation in that. Obviously, cities are not homogeneous and dense, right? There's variation within the city. So you can still find pieces within the city where one of the, some of these technologies will work. But you can begin to get a picture from this of how different cities Broadly, in broad brush terms, can, have, can begin to develop different strategies for reducing their emissions. And, and this is really the role of energy technology, which is one of the dealing with this platform. One last uh, slide, just to bring uh, Lorraine's work a bit in more closely. One of the really neat things that Lorraine did in her was she went beyond just doing the greenhouse gas emissions in cities and moved into this area of, of mitigation and adaptation together. And this is also something the way the OECD is headed. It's uh, in, in the case, no, in the case of Oman, Jakarta, and Dar es Salaam, we've got some quantification of emissions, and they're fairly small, especially in the case of Dar es Salaam. 0.6 tons of CO2 per capita is a really small greenhouse gas emission. Jakarta's 4.9 is up there with the Barcelona, which we consider to be really low already. Uh, but you can see some of the adaptation challenges in these developing world cities. You have sea level rise and floods and landslides in Jakarta, water scarcity, extreme heat in Oman, and, and Dar es Salaam with the whole works, floods, drought, climate refugees. Dar es Salaam even was in, in the case where, the, where Tanzania had used to have a, a good amount of hydropower that was used for generating electricity. Not that they have a lot of consumption of electricity, but where they do have electricity in the city, so it was, a lot of it was from hydropower. Climate change occurred, the, the, the water body drew, uh, drew down its water level, so the hydropower no longer works, and now it's natural gas is being used to supply the electricity to the city. So you can see that that, that, that catch-22 situation, <coughs> climate change is actually making it harder to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the city's electricity supply. So we, this dual... building will actually maintain its internal heat for longer because it doesn't leak as much heat out. So it's more resilient to, uh, to shocks. So this is a, a big exploratory area. There's lots of, and also an area where there's lots of promised money from develop, the developing world cities. And ideally it would be spent in ways that both deal with mitigation and adaptation at the same time. So that's why it's being explored. And that's my last slide. I'm going to stop there. Only just to say that uh, if you, uh, there's a whole other side to my research as well, beyond all this greenhouse gas stuff for the environment and impacts of cities. If you want to read more about the economics of cities, there's a, a book that came out last year called The Evolution of Great World Cities. None of what I've told you today will be in here. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's actually also came out of my work on urban metabolism in some very peculiar kind of way. You'll see that we can do that. But, uh, more questions, right? If there's more questions, I, I, can, be, I can stay for another five, ten minutes, whatever, however long we go. Yeah? Uh, I'm curious, when you look at the historical data for Beijing, uh, was there any significant change uh, as a result of the 2011 Olympics? Because 
I, I know relatives who tell me that before the Olympics they can't really see the skies like all gray, but after the Olympics they can actually like see the blue sky. So was that reflecting that, the data? That, that, well, actually, I, I didn't look. I, I personally did not look at the historical data for Beijing. I was looking at the 2006 data, which is the year right of the Olympics. Uh, no. But they probably started the. <laughs> Oh, so the next, sorry, yes, sorry, yes. Uh, I have seen graphs for Beijing and Shanghai since 2006, and they are increasing in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. But whether their air pollution is increasing is a different matter, right? Because it's not, you're not talking about local pollution. There are some tiny things together, but the, the greenhouse gas emissions are going up. Yeah. Um, do you plan on looking at a lot more developing countries such as the Twitter? Because it seems that developed countries are more likely to have a smooth uh, robust estimation, but if the more volatility in the developing countries are not going to be the same, it's just something we have. The Indian missions were, were that we had in our study back for uh, 40 cities were pretty low, around right about one or two tons per capita. But that was really old data from like year 2000. And I saw a statistic the other day saying that water ownership in some Indian cities had increased eightfold in the last decade. Right? And so I suspect that Indian cities greenhouse gas emissions have <coughs> substantially increased. Uh, there is, again, there's, there are people, I, I personally, uh, am I working in any great country? Well, Lorraine works in the bank now, so she does it by herself, I guess. I know uh, other people in my research network have been doing some stuff in Indian cities. Uh, it, it is, I think it is, it is where the great policy interest is, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not specifically targeting myself just now, in terms of my work. Yeah. I'm wondering, who do you see as the primary drivers for improvement in, in these areas, in terms of uh, reducing GHGs? Uh, is it uh, municipal governments? Is it, is, it, is it countries? Is it international governing bodies? I mean, everybody wants to have an improved environment and, and better, and, but who's who's really driving it and who has the the power? How 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 do we make some of these things happen? That, that, that's a that's a good question. You know, in the case of the North American cities, the mayors saw. I think the, politically the mayors saw. Look, nationally and federally, especially under Bush, we weren't really doing it. Right? There's very little action on greenhouse gas emissions. So the, the city mayors and the states to a lesser degree really got on the, if you like, the greenhouse gas bandwagon because they saw that it was important, uh, both in terms of doing something for the environment and important politically for them as well. They seem to be doing something. Uh, and so the cities have been at the forefront of the political process, and the C40 was created specifically to do with climate change in the city. There was a report, though, about, oh, one or two years ago by Harry, who went through the C40 cities and said, well, which, what do the cities really have control over? And it actually turns out the cities don't have an awful lot of control, or at least the control, you know, they have control over local planning, which can affect transportation issues, but they don't have control over the vehicle technology, which is really controlled by national governments and the auto industry, right? Uh, not, many, not many cities have control over electricity generation, they can bring in the, they can encourage renewables and local power generation, but the, the big ticket items are still outside of it. So it's actually it's it's a bit of an even balance between cities, states, provinces, and, and, and national level as to how much control uh, they actually have. And and on another point, my my graph showing those cities that were actually reducing emissions. We actually looked at the nations that those cities were situated in, and all the nations were actually reducing emissions too. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't all about the cities, even though the cities think that they really are driving it. And, and I like to play with the fact, I'm an urbanist, so I believe the cities are have a big important role. But it, it, it's not the whole role, it's, it really isn't, there's an even distribution of responsibility in this area. Yeah? Um, so besides getting off coal, what, what's um, the most prominent thing that Toronto could do to reduce our GHG emissions? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, I think. Uh, our, our, our no, not buildings. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our biggest source of GHG emissions is buildings, right? It's natural gas, 
it'd be a combination of two things. One, bring in really good building codes. I mean, there's progress, but you know, lack. it's lacking. We're not Sweden yet, right? Like Kim Preston all the time, right? And then, and then major building retrofits. But to go really to sort of the 70, 80s percent below, uh, you'd also have to begin to look at alternative heating sources, such as the borehole thermal energy storage systems and, and uh, aquifer thermal energy storage systems. Uh, if you play with our getting to carbon neutral tool, that's the, those are the magic <laughs> technologies that really can make a difference. I mean, there's obviously other sectors too, like transportation. Toronto is a good place to do electric vehicles because our electricity emissions are low. Uh, so that, that's the yeah, I have a question on it. What would you say is the importance of spreading the DHG emissions per capita? Because uh, if you see like the Kyoto Protocol or the Copenhagen Accord, when you when they establish the targets are not per capita, are right. actually for the, the total amount of the country. And when uh, I see analysis like this, usually the, the results are expressed per capita. Right. And and this is seems to be unfair for countries like Canada, for example, that has only 2% of the GDP emission of the world, but has a higher GDP per capita than China, that is actually lower GDP per capita, where the amount of the, or the percentage of the world is actually higher. So what is that important to show it per capita? Why, why, why people important? is still doing that? I think we started doing it per capita in our world. Uh, mainly, mainly, I guess originally from a, from a presentation perspective, we wanted to be able to compare the cities, and we had cities of very different sizes. So if you compare Los Angeles with Geneva, you know Geneva is this tiny little bit, and Los Angeles is really big bit. We don't even see Geneva. But, but another answer to why it's really important is, is if you kind of take reduction in greenhouse gas emissions as being kind of a, a shared global responsibility then you really need to be thinking about reducing it. And each person has to bring down their own emissions to a certain degree, right? So that's, that's one reason why you can do it for capital. Uh, but there's, no, there's really no hard policy signal or message in the media for capital. And, and uh, like I said, uh, maybe 20 minutes ago, some, uh, you know, some of my colleagues have said, you know, at like the OECD and other places, they make sure you show the totals as well as the capital, because that's what we really care about is the total emissions. So it's, it's, but you know, it's, it's a good presentation. It's more for comparison, right? Yeah. Between cities or Yeah. One more here. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, wondering, do you know the status on uh, this carbon tax plan applied at city level? Do you know if it's going through or? Yeah, well, yes and no. Uh, so, there was, there was, they tried to establish something like a CDM for cities. Think development mechanism for cities. And Amman was, the, the World Bank was sort of in the lead, and Amman was going to be the city that was going to do it. And that's why that was one of our cities in the inventory. Amman was financially challenged, and so it's got these great urban plans, and they want to do an LRT or BRT system, but they can't finance it yet. They need the bank to finance it. So that got to hold up. But then the Koreans, uh, the Korean cities may be moving into fill the void, and it may be a Korean city. But Made, it's a bit confusing because the clean development mechanism is actually meant to expire this year. <laughs> and so there's a bit of a void to be filled at the national level on what this new mechanism will be. And until that's resolved, having a city's equivalent to the new mechanism is getting, is getting held up. So let me clarify briefly. So it's basically a tax applied to carbon emission within the city. and. Every single city within a country would be competing. It's not a tax. I'm not talking about a tax. So it's not. So okay. So it, it, it would first of all be a well, the clean development mechanism is a way in which one city can get a credit by by reducing emissions in another city. A credit on its okay. Country. And then from that, there are some cities in Japan that do some trading between cities, and the idea that the bank wants to do is to do trading. Trade, the trading emissions, a bit like the European uh, uh, trading system, a system for uh, energy emissions. Yeah. They want to do something like that between cities globally. That's the one that I really know. I, I can't profess to be the, an expert in that. <laughs>
You had a question. Oh, yeah, it was more coming back to what Sandy said. So uh, it makes sense to me that you do it per capita to a certain extent because uh, if you if you ever want to come up with regulations that every city has to follow, you'll never, like, Los Angeles will always have more emissions than Geneva. And perhaps, uh, like, other factors will definitely influence it as well to say, okay, you have, the city has to be below X and the city has to be below Y, but I still think population would be the, the most determining factor. Yes. So, but perhaps in the future, if that is a way they want to go, it would maybe make sense to come up with these, uh, come up with weighting systems for, for each of the cities and then not do it per capita, but do it per, per weighting because... Like, like you said, the aviation one might be one of them, but population will still be the biggest determining factor. So, uh, if say population is 80% of the determining factor and everything else amounts to 20%, for the simple compa comparison, it makes sense to do the per capita, but then if you really want to come up with a true comparison, you'll have to weigh in the other factors as well. Yeah, the, uh, the different ways to, to, to display the data. Yeah, no, no, you have to, to yeah, in, when we were digging through those cities, the, some of the best, the Indian cities had counts with cattle and, and uh, animals. I can't remember which, which animals, there were two types of animals that were, that were heavily documented in Indian cities. Their emissions were, in, in per capita terms, very low, because you have really high populations in Indian cities, but still even in total terms are fairly low. But some of the European cities would begin to have well, yeah, kind of like farms. It, 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 globally, agricultural emissions are, are important. But when you're focusing on cities, they really don't, they're kind of small. Just to be. Yeah? Sorry, just curiosity. Um, in your first study in 1960, when you chose the European cities, except for London, why Prague and not uh, Brussels, for example? Ah, it's, it's all a matter of, of, of knowing people and knowing where data is. And, yeah, it, it really just depends on known scientists there. Prague, Prague, there was a part, report on Europe's environment that the Czech Republic had been responsible for in the, in the 90s that, that uh, had actually done a tables and study of Prague, and so it was a good thing to, to ask. Yeah, that was a good question. I mean, it's so something that you get asked for when you submit a scientific paper. People say, well, why did you choose it? How do you how do you design your experiment with these ten cities? And there is really no better answer than, than, than sheer opportunity. <laughs> right? So yeah. So I just wanted to continue the discussion on the per capita. I thought it was a very good question, and I never thought about it. But from a policy and political perspective, I think it makes also very much sense. From a polit political perspective, the message sending is that of shared responsibility. And from a policy perspective, in a structure and system that has federal, provincial, municipal level, it's more pragmatic to handle and calculate, as you were saying. That. So it has not only measurement and scientific pragmatic issues, but also policy. Right. Yeah, no, it, it, the, both, both approaches have, have some advantages. I, I, I'm going to suggest I do maybe one more if there is, or for the day for me? <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. Well, uh, yeah, on behalf of the class.